This is Your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 144. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Hello friends, welcome back to your Anxiety Toolkit podcast. I am so thrilled to have you with me here right now. We take a breath and check in with ourselves. How are you doing, right? How are you feeling? What are you feeling? Where's the tension in your body, right? Are you taking care of yourself? What do you need? Have you got your hand on your heart? Are you being kind? Really, really important questions because things are hard out there right now, right? They are a little bit rough. But that being said, I wanted to bring on someone today to talk about something other than COVID-19, something other than the coronavirus, and something more that is in your control, right? So we know that we can only control what we can control and we're best to leave alone the things we can't. And I wanted to sort of bring you a tool or a a new way of thinking or new way of doing that is in your control or is hopefully somewhat in your control, right? Today we have Heather Lillico. She is a registered holistic nutritionist and she's a yoga instructor as well also a very delightful human being. And she is on today to talk about how what you eat can help with your mental health. She did a beautiful job of just sharing little tidbits, little slight changes you can make here and there. And after I recorded this, I was so inspired that I made quite a few changes in our diet. Nothing extreme, right? Because you guys know I don't believe in any kind of extreme dieting or restriction or any of that. But Heather did a beautiful job of just explaining to us how we could just be a little more wise with what we eat and a little more intentional with what we put in our mouths and on our forks. And so I'm so thrilled to have this episode and share it with you at a time where food is actually really, really important, right? Like food will keep us nourished. Food is also a huge source of pleasure. Food is where we can join as a family and communicate and and have connection. It's a huge piece of our mental health right now. And so I thought this was a really, really great time to have this conversation with Heather and talk about all things food, one of my favorite topics in the world. (laughs) So I'm just going to move right over to that. Before we do, I just wanted to let you know, because of the coronavirus, I know everybody is scared Everybody is probably experiencing an increase in their symptoms, whatever that may be. I have decided to open up ERP school for anyone who needs it. So in addition to that, we also have BFRB school, which is the course for hair pulling and skin picking. We also have mindfulness school for OCD, and that is a course to teach you, you know, medium, intermediate to advanced mindfulness tools for you to practice and apply to your OCD. They are all available. Usually I open them and close the cart depending on the time of the year. But for right now, they're just going to be open. If you feel that that would benefit you, go on to cbtschool.com and check it out, right? They're there for you. I wanted to give as many opportunities for you to get the resources you need. In addition, I, on Instagram, I'm offering one free scholarship to any of those courses. So you get to pick which one you want each week, right? So I've already given away several. I'm so happy to do that because I feel like that's a way I can contribute. But 
if you're wanting, if you can't, um, you haven't got the resources for ERP school or any of the other courses, go on to Instagram and we can arrange to get you in to the scholarship application. Okay. So let's just go right over into the show. Thank you, Heather, for being on. And I hope you guys enjoy it. And I hope again, take care of yourselves, put your hand on your heart. You know, I hope you're being kind. I hope you're being gentle. I'll talk to you soon. Well, welcome. I am so excited to have this conversation today about a topic I have been meaning to have for quite some time. And I'm so grateful today to have Heather Lillico with us. She's going to talk to us a lot about topics we haven't covered. She's a registered holistic nutritionist and also a yoga instructor, soon to be meditation instructor and teacher. So welcome. (laughs) Thank you for having me, Kimberly. I'm really excited to be here and to bring this topic to your listeners. Mm. So tell me a little bit about you and the work that you do. Sure. So as you as you said, I'm a registered holistic nutritionist and a yoga instructor. And I think like many people who work in this area of mental health, it was through my own struggles that I wanted to help others. And it's really a story that I've only been sharing for a little bit now. And the response has been incredible. I've had, you know, friends who I may not have had this dialogue with, that we've opened up this conversation about mental health. And I've had acquaintances reach out to me and people I didn't even know reach out to me on Instagram to say, hey, me too, this is happening for for me too. I'm struggling with this as well. And so a little bit of background, I've always been kind of a cautious person, I would say. I had a tendency to worry growing up. And I've always been a bit of a perfectionist, but I only really developed anxiety when I was in university. I had the pressures of, you know, like other students, a high workload. I was trying to make new friends and I developed panic attacks. And I remember when I had my first one, I was at a crowded party in university and my heart started beating fast and I started to sweat. My stomach was in knots and I thought I was going to pass out. And so I remember I locked myself in this bathroom and I just sort of slid down the wall and just had to wait for it to pass. So ever since then, I was terrified of like, when is the next one going to hit? And so all throughout university, I would alternate between having episodes of high anxiety and deep depression. I couldn't focus and I, I really just didn't feel like myself anymore. And I knew that I I couldn't live like this. I could not spend the rest of my life feeling this consumed by all of these mental health issues. So it was a friend of mine who suggested that I try switching up my diet. And to go along with the anxiety, um, I also had an IBS happening, irritable bowel syndrome, and which I've come to learn is very common (laughs) that a lot of people who have anxiety also have issues with their digestion. And so I was willing to try anything. So I started to switch up my diet. I incorporated some real whole foods and some veggies. Now, this was in university. So I was basically existing off of macaroni and cheese and Mr. Noodles anyway. So I think anything would have been an improvement. Uh, But I did started to see I started to see changes in my mental health and started to notice that my mood improved as I incorporated more and more plants and whole foods into my diet. Uh, And then when I went a step further and started incorporating more mindfulness into my routine, I noticed that my mental health improved even more. And so I wanted to share this with others, which is really why I've chosen to work in this area, because I think that we're capable of so much when we don't have this anxiety holding us back. Right. I love that story. That's a very cool story. (laughs) Now, what made you decide to become a registered holistic nutritionist? Well, I saw when I did make these changes in my diet, I saw that my mental health was improving. And I think for a lot of us, we don't really make that connection between what we're eating and how we're feeling. And I mean, the food that we're eating, of course, it gives us energy. You know, we, we know this, but I don't think we really draw those links between what we're eating and this correlation of of how it makes us feel. And so I wanted to bring that to others. And there's lots of different types of nutritionists or areas that you can specialize in. I've chosen to work in this area because it was through my own experience that I really saw these changes in my mental health and saw what a profound impact diet had on my mental health. 
Mm. Okay. It's amazing. And what is the difference just for, for me to know too, is what is the difference between a registered holistic nutritionist and let's say another type of nutritionist? I think the benefit of holistic nutrition is it's right there in the title. It's a very holistic approach, right? So we work a lot with like the mind, body, spirit connection. So it's not just the food, but it's also, it's your mindset. It's your sleep. It's your exercise, your mood. All of these things are going to impact your health in a very big way. And so when I work with clients, it's not really just you know, eat more broccoli, eat more greens. It's what, what are your sleep patterns? Like, how is your mood? Are you getting any movement or exercise? Are you bringing any elements of fun of play into your day? We go over all of these things where perhaps other types of nutrition work might just focus solely on a meal plan or the diet. I'd like to bring in all those other elements. Excellent. Very cool. All right. So tell us, because this is the question I am kind of burning to ask you is Mm -hmm. what nutrients may be lacking when it comes to anxiety or mental health struggles? There are a few key nutrients, Kimberly. So we know that people who have anxiety are generally found to be lacking in omega-3 fatty acids. So those are your anti-inflammatory fatty acids. Our body can't make them. We need to get them from our diet. Now, our brain is about 60% fat. So some of these fatty acids can be helpful in the brain to help reduce levels of inflammation. So that's one of them that people are typically found to be low in. Um, Magnesium would be another one. Magnesium is often called the calming mineral. And magnesium has a role in GABA production. So GABA is our brain's relaxing, kind of calming neurotransmitter. Magnesium as well is involved in over 300 reactions in the body. We know it plays a role in muscle soreness. It can play a role in digestion. So it it has a big impact in, in a lot of different ways. Zinc is another one. It has a role in GABA production as well. It's also linked to immunity. People with anxiety are chronically found to be low in zinc as well. And then we also see that people with anxiety typically are found to be low in antioxidants. So these are vitamins like vitamins A, C, and E, or different components that are found in fresh fruits and vegetables. And antioxidants, what they do is they're kind of scavengers. So they go around the body and they clean up all of these things that we call free radicals. And free radicals could cause damage to tissues or to the brain. And so antioxidants help prevent that damage. So interesting. And I'm just going to ask because I'm sure people will have the question, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it that the lack of you know, complete nutrition can cause that? Or is there also a chicken and an egg factor here? Yeah, I think it's a, it is a bit of a cycle. I don't think we fully know. But what we do know is, okay, so people with anxiety are found to be low in these nutrients. If we supplement or, or people can get them through their diet and we bring their nutrient status back up, we know that their anxiety does go down. So it, and it is a bit of a cycle because what typically happens, what I see in practice is when we are anxious, our diet is often the first thing to go out the window, right? We don't feel like we have the energy to cook these healthy, nutritious foods. And so then what happens is we end up making poor food choices, food choices that don't have as many nutrients as we need. So then we're not fueling our body properly. We're not delivering all the nutrients to our brain that it needs. So then we we feel kind of crappy. We feel more anxious. Now, what happens when we feel more anxious? Well, we make poor food choices once again, and it's this cycle that rotates through. So my aim is, is to kind of help break that cycle and say, hey, let's focus on diet first, maybe, and let's see how that impacts anxiety. Right, right. And alongside like traditional psychological, you know, interventions as well. Very cool. Absolutely. I think the diet is like, it's one piece of the puzzle. I think all of these other modalities have their role in helping to support someone's recovery. I don't think it, yeah, I can't just come from one area. It has to be this holistic approach. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate that you're bringing that into it because I do think even I would go as far as to say, sometimes even I notice my clients is they're so focused on getting better in therapy and doing their homework that, that they'll come in and say, you know, I stopped exercising or I'm Mm -hmm. not eating as well because of the effort that they're putting into their recovery. So I think that's interesting as well. Right. And I mean, I sympathize because 
going through therapy myself, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to put in that effort. And we know that, you know, recovery isn't a linear straight line and there are going to be these dips and, and struggles and this roller coaster. And so it's interesting to think about, you know, how can we make this as easy as possible for people? So if, if a client of mine says, I really just don't have the energy to cook, then we talk about, okay, what about a food delivery service? What about a meal service? What about a service that can just deliver your groceries or, you know, here are some recipe ideas that are, you can make in 20 minutes and include fresh, real whole foods. Right. Right. So that's a good segue. And you've listed off these nutrients that may be lacking. What, Mm -hmm. what foods would that be? Yeah. So, and I do find that for many people, we tend to stick to our, our favorite foods, right? We tend to stick to our basics. Maybe for veggies, you have carrots and cucumber and romaine lettuce or or something in there. And, and I grew up with, you know, carrots and, and green beans on the side of my plate and like maybe broccoli if we wanted to get really wild, (laughs) but it was pretty, it was pretty basic. And so I think we have to think about how can we incorporate more and more variety into the diet. So when we're talking about uh, omega threes, is there like a a food that comes to mind for you when I say omega three fatty acids? For me, like uh, yeah. fish and avocado, I'm guessing. Mm, okay, okay. So mostly, most people would probably think of fish, like fatty fish, like salmon, right? We, we think of as omega-3. So that's definitely a good source, but I encourage people to think beyond that. So we have salmon as a good source, but you also have these smaller fish like herring and mackerel and sardines, these tiny little fish. They're a really great source of omega-3s. And as well, there are plant-based sources of omega-3. So flax seeds are a really great source of it. Chia seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts. These are all excellent sources of omega-3s. The thing about plant-based sources is they're not as well absorbed as animal sources. Your body has to do a, a bit of a conversion so they get to their active form. And our body's not that great at it. So this is why you do want to vary the source that you're getting. Or you could consider, somebody could consider supplementing for omega-3s. And meaning in the form of a tablet, a supplementation in terms of a tablet. Yeah. 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 It can come in the form of a fish oil supplement. That's like a capsule. There are liquid ones out there with a lot of my plant-based clients will do an algae based supplement because you can get omega threes from, from algae. And then we see for our minerals so things like magnesium and zinc, we can get from a lot of nuts and seeds. And I find these are things that are really easy to incorporate in the diet because you can sprinkle seeds on on anything. You know, you can add seeds or nuts to smoothies. You can make energy balls with these things. These are things that are pretty easy to incorporate. We also see for magnesium, dark chocolate is a really great source of it which most people are pretty excited to find out. (laughs) And then as well, leafy greens are great for magnesium. And I always encourage people to think outside the box a little bit, because when we're thinking about leafy greens, maybe we think romaine or spinach, but there are things like dandelion greens that somebody could incorporate, collards, kale, of course. You know, there's just lots of things out there that when we think outside of our box a little bit. And then as well for zinc, so we have our our seeds and and our nuts. Uh, Pumpkin seeds are a really great source of zinc. And seafood as well is a good source of zinc. And then I didn't mention as well, so antioxidants that we talked about, these are things that are deep and bright colored foods. So picture like red cabbage, berries, kale, collard greens, artichokes, all fantastic sources of antioxidants. And with antioxidants, they can degrade. So this is something that you want to consume as close to picking as possible. This is why it's great to eat local fresh foods because you're going to get the antioxidants in their highest form when things have just been picked. Now, I'm based in Canada, in Toronto, and so we're at a little bit of a disadvantage sometimes because we're covered in snow right now. And so our growing season is a little bit shorter. Um, but you know, you do what you do what you can, and so um, you can consider buying frozen as well because. When something is frozen, it's picked at its peak freshness and then frozen so it preserves those nutrients. Very interesting. All right, great. I love this. Now, you had mentioned in our conversation this idea around an anti-nutrient. Um, can you share what that is and what relationship that has to what we're speaking about? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I want to preface this by saying I'm all about everything in moderation, you know, and if you want the cookie, have the cookie, enjoy the cookie. But if somebody has anxiety, there's two things that might not be great for them. And that's caffeine and processed sugar. So the reason these these things I see in practice lead to some trouble is that they activate our sympathetic nervous system. So this is our fight or flight response, right? Now in anxiety, this pathway is activated a lot. It's constantly being tapped into. We want to switch over to our parasympathetic side. This is what's called our rest and digest side. So in order for your digestion to happen well, for you to assimilate all these nutrients that you're having from food, we want to have you switched over to that relaxed side. And so if you're consuming caffeine and extra sugar, then you can be activating this sympathetic side a lot. So the impact of that is that you're not going to digest your food as much. You're actually going to lead to more anxiety because you're going to feel jacked up pretty much. And what I see in practice is that when I have clients cut down on their caffeine and their processed sugar, we do see big improvements in anxiety. And I've noticed this myself in coffee. I used to be a coffee drinker and I stopped because I was just feeling too jittery. And maybe you've noticed too, if you have too much coffee, there's that feeling that comes with it. Right, right. Yeah. And so for those people, I often will use this as a part of my assessment in terms of asking questions about caffeine. And people often will look at me and go like, don't take my coffee away. (laughs) (laughs) What would you recommend in terms of the maximum coffee intake? You know, that's that would be within like a healthy, reasonable realm. Yeah, I think it's going to be individualized. I think for some people, you know, one to two coffees a day is fine. They can function. They don't feel jittery. But for some people, even having one like myself, I couldn't even have one coffee. But there are loads of alternatives out there. So there's tea, which still has some caffeine in it. But for most people, it won't cause that same jittery reaction. Tea, um, especially green tea, is rich in something called theanine. And theanine is very calming for the body, but yet doesn't make us sleepy. So it doesn't give you that same spike that caffeine would and then that crash usually. Instead, it keeps you awake and alert, but without feeling that extra anxiety added on top. Um, And as well, for most people, having coffee later in the day will affect their sleep. And so I typically recommend no coffee after 3 p.m. because it can take around six hours for your body to process that out of its system. Yeah. And I think a lot of my clients have even said like even midday, they still will notice, you know, that sleep because we, you know, for anxious people like myself and and all of the people out there who have Mm -hmm. anxiety, it's our body's kind of shaking, going, sliding into bed anyway. So Mm. I really appreciate that you're bringing that up because it's super important. Yeah. And I always ask clients too, like, why do you need coffee? What purpose is it serving? Is it that you're so tired that you need caffeine to stay awake? Because then let's tackle your sleep routine. Let's focus on why you're not sleeping and why you need caffeine to wake up. And I always find it so funny that people need their coffee right in the morning. And I'm like, shouldn't that be the time that you're most awake (laughs) that you've just had eight hours of sleep? And shouldn't you feel most alert in the morning? Like, why do we need this coffee to wake up? So I think it's just interesting to examine, you know, what we're using this for. Right, right. And very interesting. So as we're talking about, you know, nutrition and nutrients, is this something that, like we said, you could take it in food, natural form or supplementation? What is the impact in terms of once we swallow it, how does that gut and anxiety connection, how is that even happening? Yeah. So, I mean, our anxiety impacts our gut in a really big way and it is uh, vice versa as well. But I'm sure you've noticed this connection before between your mood and your stomach. Let's say you have a big presentation and you're nervous. You get that like that feeling in your stomach, right? It just drops or something big is coming up and you get those butterflies in your stomach. Um, so we know that there's a connection between our brain and our gut. So one of the ways that there's there's a connection is through the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve goes from our brain down to our gut. And it helps activate that parasympathetic nervous system. And now that's what needs to be on for our digestion to happen. And so if somebody is feeling anxious, that probably isn't switched on. So what I'll have clients typically do is focus on doing some deep 
breathing before a meal, because that's going to help activate your parasympathetic side, which is going to help you digest your food, your food better. Now, most of our neurotransmitters as well are actually made in the gut. So about 90% of our serotonin, which I refer to as our brain's happy juice, a lot of that is is made in the gut as well. We know that GABA, so big role in anxiety because it's your relaxing neurotransmitter. A lot of that is made in the gut. Now, who makes these? What's the role? This is our bacteria in our gut. This is our microbiome. We have over a thousand different species of bacteria in our gut and about two kilograms of bacteria. So there's a lot going on. And I don't think we fully know yet just how important these little guys are and really how little we do to help them survive. Because when we are in anxiety mode and we're in this sympathetic fight or flight state, the bacteria in our gut are going to go down in numbers. But kind of the cool thing is that the relationship goes the other way. So that if we work on the bacteria in our gut and we bolster their numbers and we feed them all these yummy, nutritious foods that they want to eat, we see that our cortisol levels go down, which means you feel less anxious. So it can go the other way too, which is kind of cool. Right. Now, how would we do that? So, I mean, I always focus on the steps to good digestion with a client. So in working on gut health, we want to make sure that we're taking these deep breaths before our meal, that we're having calm, quiet meal times. We're putting the phone down. We're putting Instagram away, which I know is so hard. I struggle with this one a lot, <laughs> but we're turning off the TV. We're chewing our food thoroughly, which is sending a signal to our body and our stomach that says, Hey, get ready. Food is coming your way. Get ready to digest. And then it's really what we're feeding the bacteria as well. So when it comes to gut health, there's two different types of things we want to consider. There's probiotics and prebiotics. So probiotics are the healthy bacteria. So these are things, these are fermented foods. These are things like yogurt or kefir, tempeh, which is a fermented soy, kombucha, miso, sauerkraut, real pickles, And and this is introducing more good bacteria into the system so that we can make these neurotransmitters so that we can, you know, balance our blood sugar properly and release energy from our food. They also make some of our B vitamins, which are important for energy. And then we have to feed the existing bacteria that's there. This is with prebiotics. So these are fresh veggies like, you know, artichoke, radishes, asparagus, and also legumes. So like beans and, and chickpeas soy, different nuts. These all feed the bacteria that already exists there. Interesting. I have a question. So I take a probiotic. Mm -hmm. Why do I, I've been instructed very, very sternly by my nutritionist to eat it on an empty stomach. Mm -hmm. Why might that be? So there's a little bit of debate about this actually in the nutrition community, which you'll find basically about every nutrition topic. (laughs) There's always debate about it. It really depends on the type of supplement. So some supplements will work best when you have an empty stomach because they can make their way through the stomach a little bit easier without food there, without massive amounts of stomach acid there. And then other supplements, we want stomach acid there. We want a little bit of food sometimes because it helps with the nausea of a supplement that it could cause, but sometimes it will just help it work its way through a little bit easier. So there is a little bit of debate about you know, when is the best time to take a probiotic? Should you take it on an empty stomach or, um, or with food? And so it really depends on the manufacturer and, you know, how they've designed the supplement to be delivered. And so I, I always recommend clients, you know, follow the instructions on the bottle because that's how it's designed, but it does depend on the supplement. All right. Interesting. Thank you for answering mm-hmm. that. Cause I think, mm-hmm. okay. So it, and to, to add on to that, so we have this option to do a probiotic or a prebiotic in a supplement or a food form, which would you recommend? I think it depends on the client and their needs. So, I mean, I always try to go with food first because this is how nature has designed food to be delivered to us, right? A lot of times in food, we'll see that different vitamins are there together and they have a bit of a synergistic effect. So perhaps, you know, one vitamin is going to help another absorb in the body. And so sometimes with supplements, you miss out on that nuance that might not be happening in the same way. 
I find for digestive issues specifically, a probiotic supplement can be really helpful. But with any sort of digestive work, even introducing fermented foods, I always say start low and go slow. We don't want to overload the system with too much bacteria because then you can have an adverse reaction and you can maybe think, oh, this, this supplement isn't for me or you know, I'm, I'm feeling really ill because of this. And it, it's not because of the supplement per se. It's just because the amount was too much to start out with. And if your system is sensitive, typically people with IBS, their stomach is sensitive. And so we want to just start low with a, a probiotic supplement. I usually start with a couple billion and then work my way up from there. And even with fermented foods, if somebody has none in their diet, which I find for most of us, we maybe have yogurt, but not probably not a lot of other ones. I like to introduce, you know, one to two times a week. We're introducing one. We see how that goes and then level up from there, adding more and more in, eventually getting to the place where we're having two fermented foods every day and at least three different types in a week. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, and probably most of us aren't doing this or we're just not conscious of how to work these things in. And this is the work that I do with clients is making it realistic for somebody because it's one thing to say, here's the list of foods that's great to consume, but it's another to say, okay, how are we going to actually work these into your diet? How does this fit with your lifestyle? Right, right. What might be some easy ways to start this process? You know, do you have any suggestions for people? I mean, I'm all about how can we maximize your nutrition at every meal? So if somebody is having a smoothie, let's say for breakfast, then let's throw in some flax seed in there for your omegas. Let's throw in some hemp seeds in there for some magnesium, some zinc and your, and your omegas. Let's throw in a, you know, a healthy stabilizing fat like almond butter or peanut butter in there. So thinking through like, how can we maximize what, what you're doing and really just boost it up? How can we get some leafy greens in there? I think as well, soups and stews are a good way to get in a lot of nutrients at once. If you have like a blended soup, you can mix so many things together in there. And right now over in Canada, being in winter, it's an awesome time for soups and stews. Our bodies tend to crave these, you know, these warming things in the summer. It's more appropriate to have salads. And this is a great opportunity as well to shred a bunch of veggies in there. This could be a place for some fermented foods, some sauerkraut or kimchi goes really great in a salad. Right, right. I remember a few years ago, a, a friend of mine was saying the same. She was like, just sprinkle some chia seeds on there. She's like, yeah. you know, it's no different. Just put a little extra on top. And I, that was a really big shift to me because you always think of it being this very big process that's going to take a lot of time, but it can be very simple. Absolutely. I don't think it has to be so overwhelming because it does feel like too much, right? And then our tendency as humans is if it's too overwhelming, it's like, okay, I'm backing off. I'm not going to, I'm not going to approach it at all. It just feels like a big black box. And I don't want it to be that for people. I want it to be something that is workable, something that fits within your life. And it can be these small little changes that lead to big changes over time. And if it's, you know, just a little sprinkle of some magic dust of hemp seeds in your in your salad, then I think that's a great start for somebody. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I think I agree so much. And in terms of the IBS, it's interesting that you bring that up. Only recently I did a poll on Instagram and I was very shocked at how often people were asking questions about IBS. Is there anything that you wanted to share about that related to this kind of discussion? It's something that I'm seeing more and more. And I as well am in a few anxiety-based Facebook groups. And I always see people asking, does anybody else have IBS? Does anybody else have bloating? And so I'll usually pipe in with like, yes, this is very common. And here's why. Um, so we know that there's this big connection between our brain and our gut. And the, I think the mechanism makes sense that, you know, when we're jacked up all the time and that sympathetic nervous activation, it's really hard for our digestion to happen. And so what happens over time is that we end up with inflammation in our gut. Our gut becomes unhappy because it's not digesting food properly because we're not in the right state, the right frame of mind in order to digest our food. And so as well, what we sometimes see as symptoms, I'll see um, a lot of symptoms like bloating or, or heartburn and clients will make comments like, well, you know, this is just how I am. And this is, this is just me. You know, I, I, I don't go to the bathroom until every three days, or I go to the bathroom six times a day. And that's, and that's just normal. But 
what's common is not necessarily normal. These types of symptoms, you shouldn't feel bloated all the time. You shouldn't feel like you're having heartburn after a meal. You shouldn't feel like you're, you know, you're in this fog, this daze, or you have headaches or some sort of skin condition like eczema or allergies. All of these can be linked back to digestive issues. And so I really encourage people to not just accept something because this is how it's always been for you really get a little bit more critical on, you know, d- is, is this right? Should, th- should these things be happening? Right. And could it be repaired? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now I don't know if this is like an appropriate question, but a lot of my clients when they're anxious have a lot of diarrhea. Mm hmm. Because of that, we know that the food is evacuating out of their body quite fast. We know that it's related to, you know, our fight and flight. Our body wants to sort of dump weight to run a long distance. If someone's having a lot of that type of bowel problem, what might you suggest given that it's so common with people with anxiety? I think what's helpful in terms of like the food, things that can be helpful. So if somebody's having a lot of diarrhea, I'll typically recommend very soothing, like soups and things that are easy to digest that can kind of make their way through without too much work from the body. As well, you need to be thinking about your hydration levels if this is happening. So making sure that you have lots of water and lots of soothing tea. So things like ginger tea can be really helpful to help calm some of that and some of those those spasms. And I think this is a great time for mindfulness as well. Because we know that practicing mindfulness can help us switch over to that parasympathetic side and then help eliminate some of that diarrhea that may be happening. So interesting. And I mean, I've been very open that I used to have a very bad case of IBS. Mm -hmm. Of all the things that I traced it to the most was when I was anxious, I wouldn't eat. Mm. And for some reason, the longer I would go without eating, the more my tummy would just like clench up and and that was a huge part of the solution for me. So I'm not sure what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. This is something I see a lot of as well. I find it's it happens one or two ways. Either people are very anxious and they won't eat because of course this isn't the focus of your body when you're in anxiety mode, right? Or I see it the other way and people end up turning to food when they're feeling very stressed out and they overeat instead. So it's interesting that, you know, there's kind of these two ends of the spectrum that I, that I think people go to with food. Um, So again, these, sometimes it can be about reminding yourself that you need to eat, setting those external prompts of, okay, it's lunchtime, even if perhaps I'm not that hungry, it's an appropriate time to have food right now. And going towards those really nourishing things that are easy to digest perhaps identifying, you know, what somebody's favorite foods are. And let's work those into the routine. So it's things that feel comforting. I would never want to expose somebody to like new crazy wild foods during this period, because this isn't what they need right now. They need comfort. They need soothing. Right. I agree. I love that. Thank you so much. (laughs) Well, is there anything else you really want to tell us that I haven't asked you about? I mean, I think we hit on a lot of stuff today. I mean, really, I just want to encourage people to eat real whole foods with lots of veggies and eat a variety of them. And then to really ask people to start to tune into what they're eating and how they're feeling. Start to draw those links and start to notice if perhaps there are certain foods that make you feel not so good. Or if you are having these these symptoms of bloating or heartburn to really encourage people as well to, to seek support because these things aren't normal. And then to maybe think as well about how is your food impacting your mood? Mm, I love it. Thank you so much. Now, where can people get in contact with you and hear more about the work you do? Yeah. So I have a website. It's just my name, www.heatherlilico.com. And I have an Instagram account as well. I'm pretty active on that. I'm always sharing uh, recipes or tips or, you know, motivational quotes or things that have helped me along my journey. Um, And my Instagram handle is at Heather underscore Lil, L-I-L. And is there any resource that you would like your your absolute Bible in terms of what, what would you suggest? So I've actually created a resource because I found that there was this gap, you know, we're talking about all these foods that boost mood and 
I didn't feel like there was anything else out there to help people with this. So I've developed a mood boosting checklist, which is what I call it. And so it has on it all these different bubbles of things that we know are like the healthiest foods. So our leafy greens, our nuts, our seeds, our berries, our fermented foods. And so this checklist is actually available on my website. People can sign up to receive a copy of it. I keep it on my fridge. And uh, it's just like a nice little external prompt to just remind us because sometimes, I mean, even being a nutritionist, I'm just like so many other people that I'll get to the end of a day and I'll say, I don't even think I've had a vegetable yet today. And so sometimes it's nice to have that reminder, that prompt that we do need to eat these things. Right, right. I really resonate with that. Um, And I know I shared with you because I feel very embarrassed because my undergraduate is in nutrition. I know that I shared that with you. Mm -hmm. And I found since having children, I eat like a (laughs) six-year-old. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like, And it's hard to sort of put more color into a meal because for some reason my kids won't, they don't like colorful things. (laughs) They like brown and white things. Yeah. So I I agree with you. I think that I will definitely go and download that checklist right away because I think just having it there will even make me more aware when I'm making my grocery list. Absolutely. And just to make us more conscious of what we're eating, because I think a lot of us have lost that, right? We're sometimes on autopilot with the food and we go towards the same foods that we typically eat. uh, And we might be lacking some nutrients in our diet because of that. Right. So great. So helpful. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Kimberly. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.